So what is it like to really run a business, to be in that leadership chair? It can be very similar to leading a team where you're worried about, you know, your employees or your team members. But today I brought founder and CEO Andrew Street. He owns and runs uh, a, an agency called Dealer OMG, uh, Dealer Online Marketing Group. And at first I was talking to him about how he built his culture and was scaling his business. But the conversation evolved into what we both want for our employees and, and our struggles or challenges as we've both grown our businesses. And he was really open and vulnerable about what he had hoped, some of the mistakes he's made, some of the successes he's made, things he's learned as a leader, how to let go of things. Um, it was a really intimate and wonderful conversation. Even at one point, he said, oh, I forgot that people are listening to this. So really, this episode is you being a fly on the wall with two owners talking about the challenges of growing their businesses, the similarities, some of the struggles, how we shared and helped each other. So I hope you really enjoy this episode. I know I did. So let's dive into today's episode of You're in Charge, Now What? with Andrew Street and myself uh, talking about leading our companies. All right. So First off, Andrew, thank you for joining me today. And and one of the things I wanted to chat with you about, it's uh, as a fellow business owner and leader, you know, you've had your your company for a while and it's grown. And one of the things that I I feel leaders of companies miss on is that idea of how do I grow my business and maintain that culture or what I wanted it to be in that initial phase. But for you, how, how would you be, you know, either from your experience or recommended to someone else, how do you really grow your business and maintain that culture uh, of what you started the company to be? I love this conversation. And it's, it's not, the, the answer is not simple. And it's mm. certainly something that everybody in a leadership role or that's trying to grow an organization or lead a team and hire and fire and drive culture is probably a student of in a, in a lot of capacities. And it's, uh, I mean, the cool thing is that there's so many resources out there to pick up this information, whether it's just YouTube or podcasts, like right. tuning in and listening and having a, a platform where people can have these conversations or like implementing with consultants, with traction or with entrepreneurs organization or different things where there's just, uh, countless resources. Uh, but it sounds, I think the question's like around how to keep the culture. It's easy to say, okay, mm -hmm. here's the chart. Here's who's, 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 who's boss. And, uh, but to create a culture that's your culture and it resonates with you, you know, it starts with, you know, the business owner. And then that's something that you can kind of communicate and it, can can have a feel across the company. Uh, I imagine you can relate. It's tough to keep too, especially as like we used to have an office in Austin, and everybody I'd want to hire, I'd say, "Though you got to come move to Austin, or you live right. in Austin, and that's my pool of people." And then with everybody not being able to go to the office, we had a freeze come through. We're we're in Austin. We had a freeze come through Texas. All the pipes exploded. So we're, perma we're, we're remote and I don't see a future where we're going to get back into an office at the same 100% of people in the same office capacity. So it's like, okay, now what can we do to, and I, I'm probably mistaken, but I like to think that our culture is better now than it was when we had an office. Hmm. Okay. So, so let's think about that. Let's, let's break this down into two pieces. So when you had everyone there and you made everyone come before the pipes blew and we all got pushed to remote as well, walk, well, give give me a few tactical things that you did as you grew your business in that location. Right. So we had everybody there. What were some of the things that you said, we have to continue to do X in order to feel like we were maintaining this culture as we grew. Cause even if you went from 20 employees to 40, whatever can, even if it's in one building, 
it's getting right. further away from those two or three people that started everything. So how, what, give me some tactical things that you did to keep it going. I don't think I did. I, I, culture to me was uh, having it feel like a fun place to work. Mm -hmm. And when we interview, have kind of fun, quirky questions and have cool posters on the wall and hey, a ping pong table. And we've got a six pack in the refrigerator that nobody ever drinks, but it looks like a fun place. Uh, and we go and, and so many people, especially like born after 1989, when we're interviewing them, they're like, what's the work culture like? I'm like, oh God, you know, we, you know, we're, we used to have a foosball table, but we don't have room for it anymore. But now we go to happy hours and it was not, it wasn't very me. And I didn't know what I was doing. I just thought having cool stuff. Right. And paying for a great happy hour where we go to top golf. I don't like golf really, <laughs> you know, but then like, I'm starting to realize it's so much of this, the people it's like just caring about the staff and now mm -hmm. like, you know, and we had that while we were all together and it was kind of, we didn't have, leadership roles. It was kind of everybody did ad operations and graphic design and all the stuff that an agency does. Uh, but since we've moved out, I've spent a lot of time focusing on that culture, on uh, how to communicate that with our team, on relationships. And now like when I'm taking, when we're having like our all hands meetings, I'm taking notes on the people of what they're up to in their lives and what's valuable to them and that their dad's getting a pacemaker put in in January. And, you know, maybe they need to go to New Mexico in January to check on that. And let me remind me to follow up on that, not in an insincere calendar reminder way, but just so I have a feel for how everybody's doing outside of their day-to-day -day operations. So the, that's a long way to answer your question. No, like, but I think it's, I, I think it, I think that's spot on. And I think we, we all fell into the, we want to try and be Google, you know, where we'll get people because we have the ping pong table and we have, we'll buy lunch and we'll, but the more I've gotten past that because we had a ping pong table, I think everyone got a ping pong table or probably Google sent everyone a ping pong table. Um, I think what I hope the audience doesn't miss is your pivot to what really I think culture is. Culture is driven by the frontline people and it's knowing what the people are. You can't force culture, but it is that collaboration. I think when people feel heard, feel respected, feel involved, I think what you said when everybody didn't have a title and everybody was working together, that was the culture of collaboration versus the foosball. And we tend to want to buy our way into culture versus really getting to the point of saying, I know my people, I listen to my people, I respect my people. That I think is more important for companies moving forward than it is I'm buying a free lunch. Yeah. And it's, it's figuring out too, like what Glenn, like what you value with your people too and like what you see and that starts to resonate with like you, the the way you interview the way you hire the people you hire the people you keep mm -hmm. on the are aligned with that and you've communicated that this is what you value and like for us it's like i want to see people who give a damn people who really mm -hmm. care yep and as simple as that. And then it's like, you know, the next step is like that, that person's growing. They didn't, you know, maybe they graduated college and now, you know, if it's kind of flatlined and they're not doing anything, jo joining organizations, reading books, listening to podcasts, watching YouTube instructions for how to improve their graphic design or, you know, whatever it is, it's not a great fit. And then like, if somebody is sort of innovative too, it's like, Hey, what if we did this? Mm-hmm. I love it when somebody brings something new to the table. And then now just like now when we're interviewing people, we can kind of get a sense for, uh, do they want to have a voice? Do they want to grow? And then, you know, with that, you can sort of align 
your benefits packages and stuff like that with it to say, everybody's got a $2,000 continuing education bonus or, or uh, stipend. And here's some resources for where you could go to uh, maybe learn more, whether it's a digital dealer type of conference for our industry right. with automotive, or it's uh, you know a graphic design conference or a digital marketing conference, or it's something that's applicable to our business, but makes them better at their profession and kind of upskills them along the way uh, and kind of push that on people. You need to take this. And then same with like paid time off and uh, profit sharing has been uh, challenging to roll out, but it's been great. So every month now we're moving to where here's where we are. Here's where we're trying to get to. That's the next, you know, we're at base camp every beginning of the month. And mm -hmm. then if we do this, we'll share the profits with everybody. If we don't, we'll do some partial share. If we hemorrhage business, then we're all going to be uh, kind of connected at the hip. Right. Well, what I like about that, again, is we're focusing on people as people. We're presenting our environment very clearly. And I think that's something really important for those listening be it if you're in the, the, the very top chair or even you're running a team, what are your expectations? What, what is the day to day? What do you, what, what type of personality do you need and you want to bring? And to your point, you're saying, I want people who are motivated to learn, self-educate, they're active. Um, I look for that as well. That's one of our key uh, components is, you know, challenging them to be the ones who do the deep dive research and bring new ideas to us. Same for us. If you're going to go, if we're going to invest in you to go to a conference and learn, come back and present to the rest of the team and say, here's what something new that we learned, or more importantly, Hey, we're doing this already. And someone's out here saying this is the next, you know, big thing going on. So I think everyone I think everyone wants to feel that 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 they they matter, and I think, of course, that gets harder and harder to do as you scale to hundreds or thousands. But if that message still resonates down to the person who's running a team, because again, if, even if you have a thousand employees, they're all bucketed down into smaller teams. But if that message is coming down to each individual who's leading the team, those people matter. Know your people. Know what's important to your people. I think that's where that idea of creating an environment that's attractive to people to who want to come work for you. I think that that's much better, as I said, than, than just buying your way to happiness. Yeah. It's, it's tricky too. And it's taken a lot of, you know, for one trial and error, mm -hmm. you know, it could, I bet you can relate where, when we first, so, so we run a, a marketing firm and the first thing, you know, the first hires we had were people that we could afford. Mm -hmm. They're fresh out of college. They're not too different than me when I got out of college that was willing just to do anything to get experience. And if I had a little bit of money to pay rent, great. Um, and, and we quickly established ourselves as kind of like the John Stewart for people's careers where if you work for us for a while, you're going to get some great insights. You're going to learn a lot. And then you're going to have a great stepping stone to a real career from us. Yes. You know, as soon as you get beefed up, you're going to be ready and you're going to be worth a lot more money to somebody else than we're able to pay. So it just took time to grow past that phase to where, you know, for one, we have uh, growth opportunities, but then also just like an ability to compensate people. Mm -hmm. for their growth as they're growing instead of us just growing them and then uh letting them you know evolve their career to the to the next level which is great but it's tough to continually to start over at square one where once we got the org chart figured out once you get um clarity on how many divisions you have in your company and who's right. responsible for what even if you are the top guy if you're a smaller organization, you're going to fill four of those seats. And some of those are below other people. And one of those is you're the head of some department and you're the head guy. Um, 
so it's just kind of getting, it's been just getting clear on uh, what roles we need to fill, how many people we have to fill those. And then, you know, once we hit a certain threshold to fill that with a specific person instead of, uh, you know, a person that's, that's doing multiple roles. No. And I think that's important for those of you listening again, you know, even running a team, if you're not really clear on what you need, you can either hire too many or you don't hire the right people. Um, or to your point, it becomes a, you know, they stay with you for a year or two and it's the equivalent of going and getting a degree. And now I can go leave. And we had that very same thing early on, you know, our company has been around for almost 15 years, but when I joined maybe 12 years ago, those first few years, we had a lot of people who would come get their skills and then go somewhere else. Cause they could get more money than we can afford. And we became known as the place to go train. And that was not great for us until we built our pipeline enough in, uh, until we could afford to, as you said, reward them to stay versus saying, well, I can't match that offer. You have to go. Uh, but I think that's really important, especially for everyone who's running a team. If you're trying to grow your team as well, be very clear with what your budget is because the last thing you want to do is train a salesperson to do something really well. And then they just go down the block and get more money. And now you have to start all over again. So it is a, it's very important to understand what, 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 what ability you have to compensate your people beyond their initial, you know, entry level salary. Right. And like, like what, what I'm working on now is just sort of like, what is, what does the summit look like? And like, what are the base, base camps along the way and, and camps and what is everybody's role in that journey? And can we articulate that? Can we bring everybody's, you know, get people as invested as possible in this journey outside of just, here's your experience, here's your compensation, you know, here's your role, here's who's, here's what we expect of you, here's how we're monitoring it. But here's, you know, the North Star, and here's how we're getting there. Instead of, hey, if we get new clients, it's great because the bosses get more money. If we lose clients, it's not great because the bosses lose money. It's, we're all in this together. And as we have setbacks, we're all going to have setbacks. If When we get victories, we're all celebrating those victories because um, it's more of a gestalt than, than just a owner of a company hiring people and making them push that, you know, push that ship out to sea, but it's actually got a place it's trying to go to and everybody's got a role on the boat. And if, you know, they don't feel like they do try to have a platform where people can have these conversations of, you know, Hey, I feel like I've stalled out or I'm burnt out. Um, which is real, which is super real right now. Um, trying to, you know, work with, humans psychological issues like problems and family problems and burnout of, of what we're asking people to do and being stuck at home yeah that's that's one of the things because we've been i think now i can't remember when we all went home but we made the official decision and we sent everyone home and uh, you know basically have been fully remote and to your point earlier i'm not sure we're going to get back to a position where we would ever have everyone in one of the positive aspects of going remote was the uh, change in thought process to say that people didn't have to be all in the office. It expanded our labor pool where we could hire people in another state remotely and you'd find more qualified or a higher level or higher quality of people who wanted to work for you, but wasn't they weren't going to move. And being able to offer them that partnership, but it has been very tough to your point um, of that blending and blurring of the lines of really sitting with our team uh, in the, in the beginning and ongoing to tell people, make sure you're taking lunch, finish your day at five or whatever time, you know, do your work because we all could just work around the clock if we wanted to. And that blurring of the lines from both parts, from leadership's view on down or to the employee, 
that's where that burnout, because there's no delineation between that. It's very hard when you're, uh, I think it's very, it's a learned skill for many of us because we're put in this position, but to really be able to work at home or work remotely, it's not as easy as everyone thinks it is. Yeah. And it's not, Hey, I can, yeah. You know, as a, it's gotta be more stressful for the boss because it's harder to measure what people are putting in and all that stuff. Uh, it's not, it's not easy as, as mm. an employee or an employer working remote, you lose a few things, you gain a few things, but like, imagine as far as like, you know, you're talking about taking breaks and vacations. Like, did you see issues where people stopped taking vacations when everybody kind of came in and started just working from home? You know, um, that's a good question. I think looking back, there were always people in our company who just never took vacations or they would postpone or they'd carry over some time and you'd have to say, please go take time off. But some of them would say, you know, in their, in their own personal lives, they'd say, well, I'm not married or I'm not in a relationship. So what am I going to do? Just sit at home? You know, I might as well work. And I, un I understood that, but for most part, people took their vacations. I think it's, it's not so much to time off. I think our company, we've been very earnest about saying when you're off, other people will cover for you, take your time. It was more this hearing that, uh, well, I'm done with dinner. Uh, I'll go back and finish a few things or uh, on the weekend, I'll, I'll finish a little things or I'll start. So it became this working more hours or never feeling like five o'clock I could be done or six o'clock I'd be done. There was always this nagging thing because I could see my desk where before I'd have to go to the office and all my, all my stuff was there. Um, so I think that was more of than than taking time off. Is that like, I, I, I noticed the same thing where it's, okay, everyone's going to work remote now. The, everyone's going to be basically taking a break a lot. And, and, but it took six or eight months to realize like, Hey, nobody's taking a single, nobody's taking a vacation. People canceled their vacations. It's also because people didn't know what was going on. on the yeah. Planet. Well, yeah. Mm -hmm. But for that to like, kind of like, okay, we identify this, like, okay, we're going to move towards, an unlimited PTO program with guardrails. Yes. Like obviously you need to get permission. You need to do it so far in advance. And, you know, at some point leadership has the right to fire people if, if this gets abused, but you need to take these vacations. Uh, and I, I listened to a, your podcast where you interviewed a lady who owned an agency out of Silicon Valley. Right works with i mean you're, you're familiar with it but like she works with uh just kind of like holistically the the culture and the organization for, for, at a people level and it was cool it was great like it was a great conversation because i'm still trying to figure this out for myself where if it's just like i was listening to it while i was working a couple nights ago and it's just like take uh i forgot what she called it, like micro breaks or micro uh, micro dose breaks like that's great because it's easy to be like okay i've got a trip planned in two and a half months i'm just gonna just wither my soul away until i get to that instead of like having a way to um clear your head and take a break and step back from the computer where like i've always noticed like it's hard it's hard to take that break and go walk outside because it doesn't feel busy. Right. But staring at my laptop, looking at my internal chats and emails and ad camp and reports and all this stuff, like that feels busy. That's working, right? Hmm. When you kind of like lose sight of what, what the, the purpose of your work is and what the value you're bringing to your organization is, it's not that you're cutting out from the organization by taking that walk. It's you're, yeah. yeah, you're missing a big picture by just feeling busy. Like you feel busy while you're looking at a laptop. 
Yeah, they, they and and her name was Janet Fouts, and she and it, and I agree, it was a great episode. What what it, what when you just mentioned that, what reminded me is more of my people instead of taking vacations like a week, like you were saying, that's when I thought they could, but more people took three day weekends, you know, took Fridays off, um, you know, for our company every year in the summers, we, it just became natural because in New Jersey where our office is, uh, the Jersey traffic around the, the beaches and things like that, very crazy. So we used to always let everyone out by one o'clock, you know, so you work a little bit extra during the week and you're out at one o'clock. But we found a lot of people taking those Fridays off anyway in these little micro vacations of just going away to get out. But to your point, it is taking that time. Now, I've it's interesting being home. My two sons were home from school, you know, remote for a while. So every day around that time, I was purposely got out to go have lunch with them. And that became my break. Let me cook lunch for you and sit down and talk to you. Then I'd go back. And to your point, we can, and I think that goes back to that idea of being busy. We can always find something. We can feel like we're doing something, but did you really accomplish anything? No, I went back to my desk and I sat there and I felt busy, but I didn't really do anything versus taking that break, coming back with a clearer head and saying, yes, okay, let's go. And, um, I think that to, to your point, I think that's really important for all workers, everyone, whether you're in a business or not, you know, inside a physical location or not, it's, it's respecting that time for your mental, uh, mental health to be able to walk away from work for a little bit. It's yeah, it's tricky. And with, um, you know, and then ha like, you know, kind of with the, the theme of the, you know, the podcast with leadership that you're running here, it's like, and how can you as the organization's leader or as somebody just like in leadership, have those conversations, encourage those breaks without feeling like you're losing control or you're, um, I don't know, they're, they're like, and, and what, what that podcast sounded like too, when you were interviewing her is like, she was super, vo very vulnerable with emotions and burnout and all the stuff that she experienced during an agency. And it's like, okay, is that an opportunity for us in leadership to have that vulnerability with our team and with your personal burnout and with, you know, I don't have the answer for solving burnout, but here's what works for me. Yeah. It's not grinding, yeah. grinding, grinding, out grinding you guys working late. And then, yeah, having a cocktail to, you know, wash down the day and <laughs> check out with an episode of, what are we watching now? We're watching Succession. Oh, yeah, that's something light and fun for you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, but, but to your point, what's, what's interesting, and, and I think that's important, is when we first started going remote, I did a webinar about how to work from home. And I gave them some advice and said, find a location and say, that's even if it's your, you know, if you're living in an apartment and it's your dining room table, put your stuff away at night, like pack it away. So you don't see it. Uh, if you have a space that you can dedicate, that's that. And then try to stick to the schedule that you did in the office. If you came in at eight 30 and you left at four 30 or came in at nine and left at five, do that there. If you took lunch at a certain time, a lot of them in the beginning started doing some Zoom lunches just so they could see, because a lot of them used to all eat together and then go walk around the building for a little bit outside to get a little exercise. Um, but to your point, I had to be hyper aware as the leader to make sure I was respectful of that time. And I think that's something to your point of modeling you know, non burnout behavior is not sending emails at nine o'clock at night, even if you think, well, they'll get it to you tomorrow. No, your employees going, my boss just sent me something at nine o'clock at night, they need something or on the weekends. Um, so again, if you're pushing out of one side of your mouth to say, 
I respect your time and you need this time off, then why am I calling you and say, I mean, outside of an emergency, I mean, emergency is an emergency or client really needs something. But I think being respectful of that time is modeling that good behavior and for yourself to say, you don't need me at, you know, don't call me at five. Don't call me on the weekends unless the house is burning down. Don't call me on the weekend. I think that's where that modeling that behavior, but you, you have to commit to it or else everything just gets blurred. And, you know, there's only so much gas in the tank before you burn out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And like respecting people's square footage of their homes, you know, mm. it's, I like that you came up with that for your team. And then, you know, as things look more permanent and it's, you know, it's, it's kind of neat with having so many Zoom calls that our customers see our faces more than they used to. Yes. When we're in an office, we travel a little bit to go visit clients, but it's not really structured. Like our, our firms aren't really structured that way where we're traveling a ton to customers, but now it's, we can show them our faces. And everybody on my team has their camera on every time we talk and we're not in our pajamas. And over time, hey, the background behind you, like, hey, sometimes I've got, you know, a jacket laying on the couch. I'm going to clean that off. But not everybody has that luxury of, you know, having a, an additional bedroom or that office or whatever right. it is that they're to have that space if they're in the studio apartment where they can't walk away from their desk and then close the door mm -hmm. and be like, okay, I think I'm done today. Instead, you're sitting at your desk and you just kind of turn this way and that's like the end of your day and you're no longer looking at this laptop, but you're looking at that TV. Uh, so just noticing that and being like, you know, especially for people that live close to me, it's like, you know, can we meet for coffee? Mm -hmm. You want to go over here and work for here, from here for a bit? I've got some ideas I want to run by you. Uh, and I don't know, just break something into a healthier pattern for people's lives um, while they're working at home. Yeah. So what we did was we've now downsized our office space be just because we didn't need a lot. But over the last year and we're just moving into a new one, we just told people we are going, the office will be open. Someone will be there three days a week. We tried everything you know, scheduling teams to come in on certain days and it just didn't work. So we just said, we're going to, someone will be there three days a week. If you would like to come in to take a break from, to your point, looking at your four walls, or if a few of the team members want to come in and collaborate, the office is open. And it was amazing how many people took advantage of it. Not every week, not every day, but so many people were very happy that they could come somewhere to get out of their house, even if they had a room. I mean, I have a separate bedroom that I've converted into the office, but I look around sometimes and say, I, I need to go into the office a couple of times just to break that monotony, see other people, laugh, joke, because we still need that connection uh, besides Zoom. So I, I agree with you. It's encouraging that especially if they're around your office, if it's still open and you can do that, just finding that flexibility, whatever your, you know, your structure is. But I think it's really important because it goes back to what you talked about initially in, in culture is having that as a leader, having that empathy, that ear, that heart to listen, to be aware and to be willing to say, I don't have all the answers. Right. We'll try some things. And if it works, great. If it doesn't, all right, that's OK. No, we, we tried something. I think that also is people want to work for someone who's at the top, who's very confident, but also willing to say, hmm, not quite sure. We'll have to figure this out together. Yeah, it's, it's kind of like the adage of like, I, I well, I know what I would do, but what would you do? Mm -hmm. okay, that's a good idea. Like, what, what else could you do? And then kind of like get it more of a dialogue than like, Hey, here's a big decision to make with. Right. Seemingly big decision to make. You need to do it. It's like, okay, help me think it through or like, you know, let's, let's be empowered to be able to make that decision too. And say, Hey, here's an issue. Here's what I'm going to, here's what I think I'm going to do. Are you cool with that? Kind of 
direction than, hey, let's escalate any issue that has that red flag on it. Right. Well, I think I, I think there is a change in the way leaders are running organizations, or at least in my circle, they feel more they know they have to make a decision sometime, meaning eventually you have to be the person who makes the judgment call. We can talk about it till we're blue in the face, but eventually someone has to say, okay, this is the direction we're going. But they're much more open to asking for input or delegating something out to a group of people to come up with some solutions and then bring it to the table. And now we can all look at this. I think that's also as you grow as a leader, it's the only way you can grow your business is letting go of certain things because you can't run everything or else, you know, you, you're never going to be able to grow in your business or you have your business grow. If everything has to run through you, every decision has to run through you. You have to be involved in everything that again, goes back to the bandwidth. There's only so much. So talk to me a little bit about that as you've grown your business, how, how has it been in your, you know, personal, like, journey yourself letting go of things as that was that easy for you to let go of things and trust other people to to handle it fully what what, what was that like that's a good question um so like my core competency like my my initial my like when getting out of college like what my focus was was design like graphic design and business to mm -hmm. a degree but like i really focused on design until I realized it wasn't, there wasn't a lot of um, climbing to do with that role. And I wasn't that great. I wasn't that good at design either. <laughs> uh, and I was like working at a billboard company and like seeing all the salespeople get the wins and the losses and getting beat up and kind of, you know, there's much more camaraderie and uh, a feeling there where it's like, okay, I want to try to get into sales more. Um, and I'm sorry. What was the question exactly? I, so, I, so, so, so the question was, uh, I know you got uh, the glamour of sales. No, uh, as you've evolved as a leader, you know, with your own company or in other businesses, when you, the more you scale up, the more you move up, the more you have to let go for yeah. other people to do. And for some people that's comfortable. They're like, okay, I trust you. Uh, other people don't want to let go of it because they think, well, if I let go of this, I may not be needed anymore because someone else will do it. So for you, as you've scaled, I mean, obviously running a company, you've had to let go of some things and let other people own them, run them and do them. It, was that easy for you to do or was that a struggle? Okay, that's where I was going with the design part. The design part was only a hard part is to really give people, uh, you know, I've, I've given a lot of like, we, we've got good, desi good designers now. But yes, it's been uh, surprisingly easy as we've been able to get people who have a lot of talent in mm. that department. And like, it, for some reason, like in the last two years, it's really been like, really having a chiseled in um, org chart where we've got the, you know, it's a, a role between the ideation and the implementation. It's like the COO and the CEO type of role. Mm -hmm. And underneath that, just having a marketing team for our internal marketing. We have a sales team. We have a customer success team. We have a development team that's developing product. And then we have uh, the admin and just having that really clear and then who's under each one and then having not so my job for a long time was kind of jumping in each department where I thought I could fill in and reactively when people needed, mm -hmm. you know, some more experience to jump in. Okay. I want to look at that with you. I'll look at that with you where now it's like, okay, there's a leader of that department. And right now my, my department's marketing, our internal marketing. So if you have questions about our internal marketing, I'm the person, but if you have questions about, uh, you know, uh, product development that we're doing, there's a clear org chart for it. And I'm not the best suited for that conversation. I'm, ha you know, I can make myself available, but right. somebody knows a lot more. And same with our customer success team. If we're having an issue with a with an inventory fee, blah, blah, you know, all the stuff right. that happens with these agencies, there's a team of people who are really in tune with that conversation, with that relationship, 
with that piece of technology to be able to manage that uh, with that team. And, you know, initially I just kind of jump around and kind of be confused on try to learn it, you know, but now to be able to have that clarity on here's our departments, here's who's in charge of that department, and here's the one I'm in charge of. That's really helped to get uh, a lot of the, our, you know, methodical growth where we're not losing, the wheels aren't falling off. And as we, you know, hopefully continue to grow, I know what seats we need to fill. Right. I know what we have currently that we can keep adding to. And I know what seats would be our next strategic hire and what that person needs to look like. Right. Whether it's internally or externally. No, and I think that's that again, really important for those of you listening is it, as you move up, it's really important to empower the teams and then get out of their way. It's not easy. Trust me, I've done the same thing. I feel, I think sometimes I'm helping and really I'm the, I'm the bottleneck because now I have people around me who've been working with us for f- between five and 10 years. We have a large group of people who've uh, been working long enough that they can look at me and say, it's you and get out of the way where, you know, newer people are not going to say that. Um, but it is important for all of us as leaders to understand that if we want to grow, we can't create dependencies. If we're creating everything has to go through us or every decision has to go through us, those folks are dependent on us. They're, it's limited versus allowing them to fail and then fixing it. Or to your point, and I, it took me a long time to get to that point. I'd say it, but in action, I just want to fix a problem till people would say, Glenn, that's my role. Let me do it. You know, tell people to come to me, don't go around me or else again, you're creating the mommy daddy complex. If I don't get what I want from manager X, I'll just come over to Andrew and Andrew will listen to me and, and maybe he'll give it. And I used to say, did you go talk to them first? Well, no, well, that's your report. Go talk to them and see what happens there. So you're right. It, it's delineating that, but then it's respecting it in the moment of work the org chart before you come on my desk, work the org chart. I think that's really important to uh, build trust in your team that you have their back. Right. And, and you're not the resource for everything. <laughs> I, right. that's what I, I always say I hire people way smarter than me to handle that. I know what I'm good at. That's why I hired these folks to do that. Yeah. And you start to learn what you're actually good at. It's like when you get somebody on your team that's better at you than design, better at you than sales, better at management, better at, you know, abstract thinking about your, your pricing, which is, you know, all these tricky things. It's like, you know, it's easy to try to come in and perfect it. Well, great leaders, I, I think really, I think people who are secure in their themselves, like you said, I know what I'm good at. I think great leaders applaud the fact that, wow, I have somebody who's really great at sales. Who I don't have to worry about that versus feeling that that's a threat to you somehow that you, you should know everything or you should be the best at everything instead of, I know how to do this, you know, um, my good friend, Dan Moore from uh, president of Vista Dash used to say as a leader, his job is to remove obstacles from his team, get things out of their way so they can run and do. So instead of trying to do everybody's job, he's looking at all the things that I should be removing. And to your point, I can start thinking about what I'm good at so I can bring that strategy and that skill to the team versus worrying about what everybody else is doing. That's just not helpful. Yeah. It's too like as it sounds like as as him him as the owner. It's like, are you more of an operational type of owner or more Mm -hmm. of a ideation person coming up with ninety five bad ideas and one good idea and working those bigger relationships and Mm -hmm. kind of the company culture and strategic direction? But where it sounds like he uh, the Vista Dash is he's more maybe in the operations of the day to day of the business. Um, where it's good to have both. Like we've got both with my, I've got a business partner, Keith, 
who's great with operations. He doesn't want to come to the table with a bunch of bad ideas. Um, but like to have, uh, you know, a, a organization where we can have, you know, two people or d- just have uh, re- relinquishing a lot of responsibilities that you're not good at, even mm-hmm. if it's not exactly the way you would want to do it. Cause like, cause it's your baby, you know, and if you were doing the business development for your agency and you had a particular way of talking about the way you best work with your customers, and now somebody else is having that conversation about how you best service your customers and it's not the way you did it. Um, it's saying here's traditionally what our, our value has been for our right. customers. It sounds like you're thinking of it more of a demo than a pitch. Here's, I've always done this pitch and it's not because it's closed more business, but it's because that's what I think our value is. And it's always has been, it sounds, you know, you're looking at it a little bit different way, which isn't bad. Let's look at both scenarios and see like, is there room for both? Should we start to move more in that direction? Right. Right. But those are collaborations. And that's the interesting thing when you were saying with your business partner, that's the way my brother and I work. He's definitely the idea a um, million ideas moving a million miles an hour. And I'm more the builder operations team, but by being together, he's made me more uh, able to trust my ideas and go and quicker. And I've been able to maybe slow him down just a smidge, you know, sort of the gas break type of thing where it, he understands if we just pause for a second, it may save us some time down, but not holding him back from ideas. And I think to your point is really understanding what you're good at and allowing that to live without being threatened by anyone else's greatness or skill in a, in a sort and looking at it, how together, like the Avengers, how we sort of make such a phenomenal team. If we all just do what we're really good at, I think that's where, again, I think that's where people going back to earlier, our conversation where it started this idea of a culture, if there's a culture where everybody is valued and my skill is valued. And if my skill is valuable, I have a place where I can grow and then eventually take responsibility and own it. I think that's where you attract great talent. I, yeah, I completely agree. And it's like, uh, I listened to an interview with Questlove, who's the drummer mm-hmm. for Roots. Yep. I don't know where this was, but he was like, it's so simple. He's like, you know, how did you guys become such a good band? How are you guys have such longevity? You guys have been a band for 30 years. And he's just like, keep showing up. He's like, every Tuesday and Thursday at 11.30 a.m., we meet for practice. And if you're not there, we'll notice. If you're late, we'll notice. And it's uh, such, it seems super obvious for running a business, but it's like, just keep showing up. Everybody needs to show up, continue to show up, you know, not just physically and with your camera, but like be, don't be hung over. Don't be, uh, you know, completely checked out. If you've got, you know, stuff going on, find a way to to take time off to deal with that instead of being completely checked out while you're trying to be present. But see that word that you just said, it was one of my words for this coming year. Um, you know, uh, in my year review, one of the words for next year is, is presence being present. And that means to your point, ready to work available wholeheartedly in the moment, I always say, be present where your feet are. So if I'm in this conversation with you, nothing else matters. I blocked out time. This hour is for us. Uh, And I think if people focus on that and to your point with quest love saying, Hey, 1130, be here, be present, be ready. We know what we're coming here to do. So be ready to do it and leave everything else outside. You know, whatever their time frame is for practice, if it's two hours, that stuff will be there when you leave but be here. And I think that to your point is when we're ready to work, let's work. When we're ready to have a meeting, be prepared for this meeting. When we're ready to go talk to a client, 
we're on our game where that that's the time to play the game, right? We're playing it's game time. I think that's really important, but setting that expectation for your team as I, I think that's why successful companies, um, continue to evolve and grow and retain is I think they do keep it simple. This is who we are. This is how we do it. If you're willing to do that, great. If you're not, you may not be able to be on our team and that's okay too. You can go be on someone else's team, but our team, we need you here present and ready, not hung over. Like you said, not looking Oh, where's my stuff ready. And I think that's super important for, uh, for businesses and for leaders, because if you set those expectations and you deliver on them and you hold them accountable and you don't waver, you start building a great foundation to build on. Yeah. Yeah. And then it, yeah, it, it opens up the opportunity too for uh, people to find where they shine within Hmm. an organization within a, you know, in this case within a business, but it's like, you know, we've had people that have kind of sw- pivoted out of roles as a, you know, instead of being a unicorn who's good at everything, it's like, you're really good at talking people off of ledges. When somebody tells you, this sucks, you suck, you are okay with being like, oh my God, I'm so glad we're having this conversation. By the time we get off this call, right, <laughs> let's have this resolved. And by the end of the day, I want to have some of these things fixed, you know? And to be able to have like, you know, it's like, like leadership, it's like in elementary school, when you play football on the, like in, in recess, I guess like, do you come in and do you like wait for somebody to give you direction on what you're going to do? Like, or is there a pregnant pause? And if nobody jumps in, you say, okay, I'm going to do a button hook. It's going to look like this. Right. You're going to hit me when I come back. He's going to go straight out. And if he's not, you know, you know, are you going to be the quarterback or the receiver or could you be either? And like, so it's kind of an opportunity for people to be either. And if, you know, if all of a sudden they jump into the huddle in this analogy that I'm not sure if it's working well, but it's like (laughs) (laughs) that, that person can, uh, you know, okay, cool. It sounds like you've got some ability to run a small team and to have some direction and come up with ideas with them and facilitate what each person is doing. Are you interested in doing that with your career? Um, yeah, it's fun. I mean, this whole thing is, a, it's a crazy game that we're learning. No, and I, I, I think I, I agree with you. I mean, this, this conversation has gone in so many directions and I hope you all are listening because what I want people to get a, take away from this is we're two owners of businesses. And we're all t- still figuring it out and learning and testing and trying. But what I hope you heard is our goal for our teams is growth and retention and respect and, you know, understanding them as human beings and what they're doing externally so that we can all succeed together as a team. And I think that's really really, truly important. So, uh, so as we wrap up, so first, Andrew, this was, this was great. I love this conversation. This was, yeah, this thanks. was a really good one. Um, yeah, I, forgot. I totally forgot people were listening. No, that, that that's even yeah. better. That's even better. Um, so at the end of every episode, I ask three or four random questions. I call them the one. So you answer with the one thing that comes to mind. Um, and then we'll wrap up. So um, first thing, what are you reading, listening to, or watching that's inspiring you that you would share with the audience? I'm listening to The Long Way Around, I think, right now. It's an audio book on Captain James Cook. I've been traveling a bit, and I've seen all these different things that are named after Cook. He's got like the Cook Strait in New Zealand and mm-hmm. Hawaii and in Alaska. Uh, I don't know. It's like, that's like the, he's, that's inspiring just to hear it here. Yeah. I'm not going to give the long answer. No, no, that's perfect. Listen, and then we'll, we'll hook it all up in the, in the show notes too. Um, let's see what, while saying that you traveled, where's one place that you would like to go that you haven't been to, assuming all the restrictions are lifted and you can go wherever you want. I want 
to go to Iceland and I want my wife to want to go to Iceland and we'll go together. That sounds like she hasn't bought in there. yet. It sounds yeah, she, wants, she wants beaches. <laughs> oh, she likes the beaches. Okay. Um, what's one piece of advice that you got in your journey that stuck with you that thought was that you said that that was really good advice? Uh, if you are that busy, you're not charging enough. Hmm. Is what somebody told me a long time ago. And as a consultant, we paid a lot of money to, but it's like, this is before we were in focused on our vertical that we're serving, but it's just like, okay, you're right. He's like, you need to have prospects that say no, because you're too expensive. It was good advice. Oh, I like that one. That's a good one. Um, okay. If I brought all of your friends, your wife, close friends, family, people you work with, and I said, describe you in one word, what's the one word they would use? God, hopefully uh, affable. Okay. That's a, <laughs> that one I haven't gotten yet. That's a good one. I like that one. I've gotten a lot of them. That one I didn't get. Um, okay. Last question before we wrap up. We talked about a lot of things. So if you hoped that the audience took one thing away from our conversation, just one, one thing that you said, I hope you got this, what would it be? I don't know if, if you are like, if you're going to get entrepreneurial and want to start your own thing and run your own business and it's just get started and continually look for resources. Mm. It's this podcast or, you know, there's just, uh, it's been a, you know, it's a long journey and there's mm -hmm. countless resources that are paid and free to, um, help. Great. Love it. Love yeah. It, it, love it. It, it, yeah. Continually. No, it, it, listen, it's not easy and you're right. There's a lot of resources out there. There's, you know, I think I, I can't remember what I was watching where someone said, listen, it, there's nothing new whatever you think you're doing, someone else has done it or a version of it. So go find what they did. There's enough books, there's videos now and podcasts and conversations that you can go find uh, ways to help you learn how to do whatever it is you're trying to accomplish. So okay. love that. Um, so great. So let's tell everyone, please, how did they contact you, connect with you? This is someone that folks you should connect with. So where do they find you on social or how do they connect with you? Uh, and we'll link everything up in the show notes as well. Sure. Uh, you could, I can be reached on email. It's Andrew at dealeromg.com. It stands for Dealer Online Marketing Group. Or you could connect with me on LinkedIn, just Andrew Street. And the company is called Dealer OMG. And uh, yeah, Glenn, dude, this is great. I love great. this platform. I love the topics. I love uh, that you're doing this. I appreciate that. That's really, really, really means a lot. Yeah, these are a lot of fun. And uh, and so for the audience, you know the drill at the end of every episode. Please make sure you subscribe on Apple or if you are an Android user over on Spotify, you can jump over to the YouTube channel to watch Andrew and myself have this conversation. Uh, please make sure you share it out. I'm sure there's a lot of people you know uh, that could benefit from what Andrew just was chatting about. Uh, I know there's a lot of places for you to consume content. The fact that you spend time with Andrew and me means the world. And as I say, at the end of every episode, you're in charge. But if you ever feel like now what now, what do I do? Well, we're here weekly to bring you tips and strategies and hopefully a few laughs to help you build the skills to be better professionally and personally. Thank you so much. See you next episode, Andrew. I look forward to seeing you in person this year as we cross paths. Good to see you, my friend. All right. Take care.